everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul... This, this week's parasha, which was uh, Vayaki, is the last parasha, or Sidra, in the uh, or Torah portion in the book of Bereshit, or Genesis. And there's a lot that's covered in there. But I want to ask a question and answer it from this parasha, uh, at least in part. What are the benefits of understanding who the two houses of Israel are. And when I say the two houses of Israel, I'm not talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. I think you probably know me, know us well enough. Because there is no Jew or Gentile in the church or the Kahilah or the body of Yeshua. In fact, on the contrary, the scriptures tell us several places in Paul's writings, Galatians 3, for example, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Ephesians, he talks about the one new man. Ephesians chapter 2. So that is, those are terminologies we prefer not to use here because they're not biblical as far as when it's talking about the saints or the kadosh ones or those that have been called out of this world. So um, what are the benefits of understanding the, who the two houses of Israel are? Now, some of the people watching this video will say, what on earth is he talking about? Some will have a better idea. And some people have been reading their Bibles for years and years and years and do not really have a clue about any of this. Um, I was watching a video uh, this week. Uh, it's a short video by a Hebrew Roots Messianic, I don't know what he was, a teacher. Uh, it, there's, gazillion YouTube videos up there. Anybody can put a YouTube video up, so it doesn't mean a whole lot. But, uh, and he was literally, she was talking about end time prophecy and, and, and uh, things that were going to happen in the future. And he was literally plucking verses out of context. Um, and, this, and, and, and he obviously did not have a clue about Bible prophecy. He picked a one verse, there was a, a, a chapter in Jeremiah, and at the beginning it says, a prophecy to Moab. Well, Moab is, a, is an area where um, it's in modern day Jordan. It's just across the Jordan River from, uh, I think it's a little south of the, De down, the southern Dead Sea area down there. But it's, it's in that area. And it's in modern day Jordan. And there was a clear prophecy to Moab or to the people of that area. And he picked a verse out of context and he applied it to America. It was a judgment against Moab made by Jeremiah. And he applied it. He says, this is what's going to happen to America. And he did that from several other passages. And people don't have a clue what they're doing. It's like, turn this guy off. Can't he read three verses before? This is a prophecy to Moab? You know, so you got to know who the players are in the Bible. Otherwise, you're going to be teaching erroneously, not rightly dividing the word of Elohim. So understanding who the two houses of Israel are is very, very important. And we say the two houses of Israel, we know that there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. We've done a lot of teachings on these things in the past. I've written and published a lot. I'm not going to go into it. But there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And the Bible refers to them to, as the house of Israel, or Ephraim, and the house of Judah. Now sometimes the term house of Israel can refer to all the 12 tribes. Sometimes you see the terms whole house of Israel. It all depends on the context. Context is very important. You've got to understand scriptures, uh, phrases that are used biblically in their context. Otherwise, you can come up with all kinds of wacky ideas. So, when we, understand, when we say the two houses of Israel, we're talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, the Bible doesn't use the term northern or southern kingdom. Uh, I'm not aware of any places it does. I don't think it does. But it talks about the houses of Israel. The northern kingdom that was initially uh, under the reign of King Jeroboam and the southern kingdom under, under Rehoboam. And you all know the story. We won't go through that. 
And the northern kingdom was made up of the ten tribes. Uh, ten northern tribes, and then you have basically three tribes in the south. Two main tribes, and you had um, some of Benj well, Benjamin and, and, and uh, Judah, and then you had, of course, some Levi, and maybe some Simeon mixed in as well. Um, so, the Bible talks about these in the end times, the most notable prophecy is Ezekiel 37, the two sticks prophecy, about these two houses coming together and becoming reunited in the hand of, in this case it was Ezekiel, but it's really the hand of Elohim, um, ultimately. And that's a millennial end time prophecy. It's something we recognize has not happened. It's begun to be happened, but be begun to happen, but not in a full sense. And it's something that will happen um, in its fuller sense at the second coming of Yeshua. Uh, we'll go into that. We've talked about that a lot. And it will continue on the millennial reign of Yeshua when these prophecies will be fulfilled. Even the Jewish sages. They call themselves rabbis. I don't use that term because Yeshua said, call no man rabbi. And so I don't use that term. Rabbi literally means my great one or my great teacher. And he said, I am the only one that's a rabbi. And that's Yeshua. And that's Matthew 23, he says that. So I respectfully refer to them as the Jewish sages. The Jewish sages down through the last 2,000 years and before have recognized that there will be a regathering. They call it the final redemption, or at least one aspect of the final redemption. Uh, many people refer to it as the second exodus. The second exodus is, is an aspect of the final redemption that the Jewish sages have been prophesying or talking about for, for two better part of 2,000 years. And they, they, will, um, they, they just read the prophets, the, the Old Testament or the prophets of the Tanakh, and they see that this has been prophesied and it has not been fulfilled yet. And they recognize it has not been fulfilled. Now in the church, in the church, the Christian church, and in the Messianic Jewish movement within the Christian church, there are many that believe it has been fulfilled. And I've addressed that issue very, very um, copiously and have given a lot of evidence, both from the scriptures and from the Jewish sages, to show that this is not what the Jewish sages believe, and this is not what the scriptures teach. And this is not what this, when I say the scriptures, the, the, the Old Testament or the prophets of the Tanakh, as well as the apostolic scriptures or the testimony of Yeshua. So we won't go into that. But this regathering of the two houses of Israel is, is a very, very important part of, this, of Scripture. In fact, almost all of the prophets, both the may, quote unquote major and minor prophets, devote so, sometimes whole chapters, sometimes whole books are devoted to this subject. So if we don't know who they are, we're going to have a hard time understanding one third of the Bible is prophecy. So I'm, I'm going to hold myself back from getting into this subject because we could be here for hours. And I've, again, I've made videos on it and I've published. But I want to ask the question, what are the benefits of understanding what, is, what has been called, what has come to be called the two house message? I would prefer to call it the one house message. Because yes, it's, there were two kingdoms, but they started out as the children of Israel as one nation, one woman, one bride, one bride of Elohim, and then they split into two, basically one nation with a split personality, if you will, kind of schizophrenic, and, and it's going to be put back together again. Humpty Dumpty will be put back together again. And that's, that, is, that process began to take place when Yeshua came the first time. He said, I have not come but the, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, we know, some people say, well, that refers to the northern kingdom. Yes, in part. But he went to the Jewish people, to the Jews first. 
and then to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. Those are outside of Israel. Um, and, uh, or outside of what Israel was recognized to be at that time. And he just told his disciples to go to start in Jerusalem, then to go to Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth when they took the message of the gospel out. So Yeshua came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which in, I believe for him included both the Jewish people, because they were lost spiritually, many of them, most of them, but also for those, he said, other, other sheep that I, I have that are not of this flock, of this fold. So that was his ultimate goal. So he started the process, and then it got sidetracked along the way a little bit, but not really, but it kind of did in the Christian church. But nonetheless, the message of the gospel in its churchy form has gone out to the world, and many people have been set free out of that. Hallelujah. And now he's calling people to understand the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith and calling us to come to the next level in our spiritual walk. So, I want to start here in Genesis 48, where the, ble the final blessing, or one of the final blessings of Jacob before he dies, is, is he stretches his hands out in verse 14. Um, the right hand he laid on Ephraim's head, and on the left hand, he, or the, um, who was the younger, and his left hand was on Manasseh. Manasseh was the older son uh, of Joseph, and Ephraim was the younger son. And he makes a prophecy over them. Now, you know, I have spent a lot of time speaking and teaching over the years about this prophecy here. And I would call it a launch pad. It simply starts the journey of the discussion of this subject. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. But I'd like to highlight several things in this passage, which I think very clearly identifies who the sons of Ephraim and Manasseh would become. Ephraim and Manasseh were the lead tribes of the northern kingdom. And so Ephraim being the, even though he was the younger, but he was given the, the, the patriarchal blessing, or the firstborn, the, the primogenitor blessing, um, uh, the double portion, uh, he, his tribe was the moniker or the label for the northern kingdom, just like Judah became the label for the southern kingdom, even though the Jews were, were only one of, uh, uh, well, there was included Benjamin and, and some of Levi and maybe some of Simeon, and, and there were a few others that were mixed in, mixed in along the way too. But Judah was the main tribe, so the northern kingdom became known as Ephraim, um, and the southern kingdom became known as Judah. So when we're speaking about the descendants of Ephraim, we're including also not only his descendants that maybe came directly from his loins, but those of Manasseh and the other northern tribes in a loose sense. This is, this is a, a kind of a poetic, prophetic sense. So here Jacob lays his hands on him, and he usually they would, the hands would be laid on like this, but in this case he crossed his arms. And I'm not going to make more of this, and it should be. There's people that have made all kinds of things about this, and, and, and I'm not going to get into that. But I'm going to say that it is interesting that he did make the sign of the cross, or the Paleo-Hebrew letter Tav. And um, he also made the fish symbol uh, over them. <clears throat> and I don't think that was by accident, because Jacob's, jo Joseph said, Dad, you know, you're, you got him crossed. And he said, I know what I'm doing. I think he was, you know, he was a prophetic. He was a prophet. The patriarchs were prophets. Jacob was a prophet. Joseph was a prophet. They received prophecies. They had dreams and visions. They were given um, prophetic understandings. So they, they did the things that prophets do. Prophets sometimes are kind of mystical in their, in their demeanor. And um, so I believe that he made the sign of the cross. Well, look, the, I prefer to use the term pay the Hebrew letter tov because that predates the cross that became eventually a pagan symbol. I believe Yeshua was uh, crucified on a cross. We can, we can prove that. Um, or, or a tree that was, you know, two posts that were nailed together like a cross. This can be proven definitively from the scriptures. That's a whole other discussion. I've taught on that before. But we see the Paleo Tav 
you know, the outline of the tabernacle, the way they camped around the tabernacle. You know, you see the paleo, the, they put a paleo letter Tav on the foreheads of those that sighed and cried for the abominations done in Jerusalem. That was an angel that did that in Ezekiel's vision in, uh, was that chapter 6? I think it's chapter 6. Uh, or nine, I always forget, get them mix, mixed up, but of Ezekiel. And we see this reoccurring throughout the scripture. So I believe the Paleo Hebrew letter Tov um, uh, is significant um, and it was prophetic and it pointed toward what Yeshua was going to be ultimately crucified on. And he also made the fish symbol. And you say, what's the significance of that? Well, we know that the fish symbol was the early. Um, early uh, symbol of Christianity, but more importantly we see the fish coming up through with scriptures as being a sign or a symbol of the children of Israel, specifically Ephraim. Uh, Yeshua chose fishermen, they weren't all fishermen, but some of them were fishermen, to become fishers of men. He made his, he made his um, uh, base of his operations there in Capernaum, which is right, if you've ever been to Capernaum, it's right on the sea. Literally, the town is right, small little town. It's, it was not very large. There's a, a wall around it. Um, and, and it's just literally right there on the Sea of Galilee. You can, you can walk from the temple that he preached in uh, about two blo one block, and you're at Peter's, what they believe is Peter's house. And then, and then I mean, you know, the rent, the, 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 um, the ruins of it, and then you just walk less than five minute walk. You're probably three minutes, and you're right down at the Sea of Galilee. Right there, it's a beautiful spot if you've ever been there. It's, uh, it's absolutely glorious. And, and he chose that as his base of operations. And, and this concept of fish is throughout the Bible. Well, let me give you a couple examples. He said that, um, he said he, um, in verse, end of verse 16, he says that, the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh would grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. The word multitude, I'm reading from the New King James Bible. Um, I think most of our English translations, our Christian Bibles, translate the word Hebrew word daga into the word grow. But it's the Hebrew word daga, which literally means to, to become uh, like, like fish in the midst of the earth. And that's how some of the, the Jewish uh, Orthodox Jewish translators translate it. So there you have the concept of fish growing like a school of fish in the midst of the seas of humanity or in the midst of the land. And he says, he also talks about verse 16, and the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. This angel that redeemed him from all evil, bless the lads. When we think of angels, we think of these angels with wings and, you know, the caricature cartoonized caricaturized angels. But the word here is malak in the Hebrew, and it literally means a mighty, well, it means a divine messenger. Divine messenger. And we see many places where the angel of the Lord is mentioned, and we know it's, a, it's, a, it's an example or a, an appearance, it's called a theophany or a Christophany of Yeshua, the pre-incarnate Yeshua, the one that became the Messiah. This is accepted in, 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 in among most Bible teachers who, who understand Messiah Yeshua. So when Yeshua, when Jacob was wrestling with the angel, it was a messenger. Yeshua is not an angel, but a messenger can be any, any emissary that comes from, from heaven. Uh, in this case, it could be an angel, literally an angelic being in the typical sense of the word, or it can be literally a messenger, uh, because that's what the word means as in the word of Elohim that came from Elohim, that became Yeshua. So here he's saying that this messenger from heaven that, de that delivered me from all evil. Angels don't deliver people from evil. I mean, they might help you in a bad situation, but deliver you from all evil? There's only one person that's ever done that, and that's Yeshua, the Messiah, when he died on the cross. Took our sins upon him, himself. So here we see... Joseph making, or Jacob making the sign of the cross, the fish, he talks about the fish in the midst of the sea. He talks about um, the uh, multitude, or the, the, uh, this messenger that saves him, that redeems him. That, the word redeem is the same word, it means salvation or saves him from all evil. So as I've asked many times, what religious group out there, what people slash religious group talks about redemption or salvation? talks about a divine messenger that it delivers them from all evil. 
has a fish symbol and has the paleolithic tov as their symbol. I mean, we've got it right here, here in this, in the, in front of the, on this pulpit in this Baptist church. If we pull the screen up, there's a cross up there. There's crosses all over the place, in in most Christian churches. And, and so, so what people group, what what church, what whatever has that as their, these as their symbols. And well, like I like I like to say, it's not the Muslims, it's not the Buddhists or the Hindus or the Hare Krishnas, or the the witch doctor in Africa, it's not, not even the Jews. That is the Orthodox Jews, the religious Jews. It's the Christians. So this is who Jacob said that your descendants would become. And then he talks down here in um, Revelation, or uh, verse 19 of Genesis 48, that, they, that your descendants would become like a multitude of nations. Well, the Jews have not become a multitude of nations. They are one nation. And that nation is fairly recent, the nation, the state of Israel. But we have the, um, we have the, um, Christianity is in many nations, and there are many so-called Christian nations. Well, not so many as there used to be. Um, Christianity is on the wane, as far as nationally speaking, in many nations. But definitely, um, no other people group fits this definition like the Christians. And like I said before, this is just one Bible verse. We could put many, many, many together, and I've done whole videos and teachings on the subject. But I want to ask, you know, who, who, why is it important to understand who the two houses of Israel are? All, the reason I went through this is because I believe the northern kingdom, or Ephraim, to use the biblical term, was who or is who the Christians became. Or the Christians became these people. That's actually the correct way to say it. And then you have the Jews, Judah. People that, that believe they're from Jewish descent. Who am I to question that? Um, if they believe they're Jewish, um, I don't know whether they are or not. They probably don't even know. They have probably a, you know, a Jewish name or maybe a family tradition. You know, and some of them, maybe, you know, I, I'm not going to question that. You know, uh, if they say they're Jewish, and you know, I'll believe them. I mean, I'm, how do I know? It's not for me to say. So, so this is this is this is this this is kind of the springboard for identifying who these people groups are. And we could go through many other scriptures and tie a lot of things, connect a lot of dots. But now for the answer to the question: What are the benefits of understanding who the two houses of Israel are? the Jews and the Christians, or the house of Israel, or the house of the Northern Kingdom, and the house of Judah. First of all, in each one of these I could probably speak for a half an hour to an hour on. But it helps us, number one, it helps us to understand the deeper implications and background of the Gospel message. You know, the Gospel message that's going to be preached here tomorrow morning, on, on Sunday morning in this Southern Baptist Church that we rent the facilities of, is, it's a wonderful message. And many people have been saved and set free, and some of you have been. And, and hallelujah, it is an incredible message. The message of, the, of Yeshua dying for our sins, and, 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 and being born again of the Spirit, and having the opportunity to spend eternity with Him in His presence as, his, as sons and daughters of the Most High. I mean, that is, that is awesome. But there is more to this story. Because, boy, I don't even know where to, there's so many ways to approach this from, I could, I could get going in 20 different directions at once. But the message of the gospel is about the restoration of the two houses of Israel. Elohim never made any covenants with Gentiles, that is salvation covenants. You cannot be saved unless you come through the blood to the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, and, and, and put your faith in Him, and once you do, you're grafted into and you become Israel. You become a child of, Ab of Elohim. You become part of the commonwealth of Israel. Ephesians chapter 2. Now I'm tossing my notes out the door and I'm covering all these things all at once. You become the seed of Abraham, the sperm of Abraham. Abraham uh, Galatians 3 verse 29. You become part of the olive tree of Israel. 
Romans 11, you become the one new man, and, or the one new woman. I'm not leaving anybody out here. I'm just quoting what the scripture says. And, and you know, and this is, you, you understand who you are. He doesn't make covenants with Gentiles. This Jew-Gentile thing has got to die. He doesn't say he's going to make a new covenant with the Jews and the Gentiles. That's not in the scriptures. Hebrews 8 verse 8 says, and he will make a new covenant or renewed covenant. You can translate the word karashah, chadashah in Hebrew or kainos in the Greek. Either way, both are, uh, both are, are relevant, uh, actual, uh, accurate translations from the languages. But he said we make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of, um, of um, Israel. Now, uh, that's Hebrews 8, verse 8. Um, let me just double check the terminology here. Um, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, that's verse 8. And he's quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 and 33. The writer of Hebrews is quoting that Old Testament or prophecy in the Tanakh. He, if the house of Judah was everybody, then why would he say the house of Judah and the house of Israel juxtaposing these two things? This is not poetic parallelism. There's plenty of that in the scriptures. But this is, these are specific people groups. He doesn't say he's making it with the house of the Gentiles. So this is why, one of the reasons why it's very advantageous to know who the house of Israel is. So you know who you are. And it's like we like to say, there's no Gentile gate in the New Jerusalem. They're named after the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is the deeper implication of the gospel message, is to, is to the restoration of the two houses of Israel and bringing people into the salvation through the Jewish Messiah and grafting them in to the covenants of promise. The new covenant which is based out of the, the Abrahamic covenant as Romans 4 says and we also have brought in there the Mosaic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant tells us how to be saved. The Mosaic covenant tells us how now that we're saved, now that we have righteousness attributed to us, how are we to walk? And the New Covenant takes both of those and builds on them and brings them to a higher level. And that's a whole other discussion in itself. I've done videos on that as well. So, and this is the covenants of promise that Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. That they, those who used to be Gentiles, past tense, who were without God and without hope, were brought into the nation of Israel through the blood of Yeshua and became part of the covenants. So it's really good to know who you are. And this is the bigger picture behind the gospel message. And it's also about the bridegroom, Yeshua, marrying his bride, redeemed Israel or the Israel of God, the Israel of Elohim, as the apostolic writers talk about. They use that exact phrase. Also, as I stated, the Understanding the two houses of Israel helps us to understand who Jehovah is making a covenant with. Hebrews 8, verse 8, based on Jeremiah 31, 31 and 33. Also, who are the chosen people? When we, in Christian or Jewish context, when we say chosen people, we're going we're gonna to think about the, um, usually we think about the, the Jewish people. And they are the chosen people. But they're one-twelfth of the chosen people. Now, the, the term chosen people, as referring to Israel, is not found in the scriptures. That phrase, chosen people. However, if you go to Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, and 14, 2, it says, I have chosen you to be a people unto myself. He uses that, those phrase, that phrase, uh, phraseology. So there you have the term frozen, chosen. I was going to say frozen chosen, but we don't want to be the frozen chosen. We're the chosen people. 
we've maybe come out of being the frozen chosen. We don't want to be that anymore. But anyway, at least I know I'll speak from my background. We were the frozen chosen. Um, but anyway, but we are the chosen people. And he wasn't speaking to the tribe of Judah exclusively. There in Deuteronomy 7 and, and 14, Moses is speaking about to all the 12 tribes, all the children of Israel. So the chosen people are the tribe of Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Reuben, Simeon, Gad, Naphtali, um, Issachar, etc. Shimon or Simeon, Asher, all the rest of them. Zebulun, I think I covered them all in a roundabout way. And um, they're all the chosen people. It's not just the Jews. That, makes, that, that kind of ticks a few people off, but that's what the scriptures say. I'm not going to say something the scripture doesn't say. So you are part of the chosen people. Hallelujah. And so is our brother Yehuda. Hallelujah. It's one big happy family. Yeah, you've all heard of Genesis 12 verse 3. Which says, Abraham says, or Elohim told Abraham, I will, as part of the Abrahamic covenant, I will bless those who bless you and will curse those who curse you. How many, of you, how many of you have heard it said that those who bless the Jews will be blessed and those who curse the Jews will be cursed? How many of you have heard that? A lot of us have. That is a perversion of the scriptures. That's not what it says. Number one, Abraham wasn't Jewish. His grand, the Jews come from his, grand, his great-grandson even, Judah. The, the word Jew comes, it's a biblical term, it comes from Yehudi, or plural, Yehud, Yehudim, and it comes from Yehuda, the tribe of Judah. And the Orthodox Jews today, the religious Orthodox, will say that we come from the tribe of Judah. They say that. That's who we primarily come from. So, the, um, when, when we say, again, like the previous phrase, chosen people, God will bless those who bless the Jews, that is true, but it's one twelfth true. He's, he said, I will bless the descendants of Abraham, and, and there was twelve tribes. So if you are in Yeshua, and you're part of redeemed Israel, and you're part of the one new man, and you're one of those ones that's going to go through one of the twelve gates in the New Jerusalem, named after the twelve tribes of Israel, and there is no Gentile gate, then you're one of the tribes. I personally don't know what tribe I'm from, but I think I will find out when the time is right. And, you know, I'm probably, probably a mixture of several of them. It <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. Um, and even if you're not biologically descended, it doesn't matter. Because once you're brought in, you get grafted in. I, I may not be biologically descended from any of them. Ruth wasn't. Rahab wasn't, and yet she was grafted. They were, they were married in, and they're actually, those two are actually part of the lineage of, G, of Yeshua. You know, Ruth was a Moabitess, and, and, and um, uh, Rahab was a, was a Canaanite. Had not a drop of Israelite blood in them, or Abraham's blood, as far as we know. So there's a place for everybody. That's the beauty of this all. And it's not, you know, one person isn't high class and one low class. One is, well, I'm Jewish and you're a Gentile. And, and this is how it's often portrayed. There's pride, and we don't, want to, we don't want to be that. That's an abomination in the eyes of Elohim. Therefore, the grace of Elohim, all of us are saved. And let's just be thankful that we can be counted worthy. And as I said, understanding who the two houses of Israel are, you understand who the children of Abraham are. Galatians 3.29 says, All those that are in Messiah Yeshua are the children of Abraham. It's stated again in uh, Romans 4.16 and Romans 9.8-11. Also, as I touched on before, knowing who the two houses of Israel are will help the Bible study to understand much of the Bible prophecy by knowing who the key players are in all the prophecies pertaining to Israel. If you do not understand who the two houses of Israel are, when when the prophets are talking about Ephraim and the house of Israel and the house of Judah and the whole house of Israel and all these terms, which I'm going to go through a few of them, I have a whole glossary that I put together, six pages of terms that refer, they're used again and again as prophecy, you'll understand what they're talking about. And then that's a caveat to the next 
point, you'll understand many bi biblical terminologies and Hebraisms. Well, let me go through a few of them. These are, these are uh, I'm not going to define them. We don't have time. But you hear phrases like this, and I have, I have a glossary of terms, which I have not published, um, but it's available, where I go through every, I went through every single term. The term all Israel is used 143 times. And what does it mean? All Israel is a term refers to all the 12 tribes of Israel. The children of Israel, as a term used in the Hebrew scriptures, are the Tanakh 603 times. The term Ephraim, as referring to the uh, specific Israelite tribes of the northern kingdom, is, refer, is used, that term is used 180 times in reference to the northern kingdom. 180 times. I've done the research. I have the data, and I've, I've defined each one. The term Gentiles is, do you realize there's probably 15 places in the Bible where the term Gentiles is referring to the Jews and Israelites? Do you realize that a Abraham was a Gentile? He wasn't Jewish. He was a Hebrew, but he came out of a Gentile background. He wasn't even an Israelite. Israel was his grandson. He was a Hebrew. He was called out. Yeah. He was called out of that. And you have the term house of Ephraim, which is used a number of times. House of Israel. That's used 146 times. House of Israel. And many of them, some of them refer to both the northern and the southern kingdom, but many times it'll juxtapose house of Israel and house of Judah. So you know it's talking about two distinct people groups. They're all Israelites, but they're not all Jews, or they're not all House of Israel. Just like all Oregonians are Americans, but not all Americans are Oregonians. You understand? All the tribes are all Israelites. Oh, let's, let's put it this way. All, all, Jews are, all Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. All Ephraimites are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Ephraimites. That's simple logic. You have the term Israelite. Israel or Israelites used 2,500 times in the Bible. And that's, that's pretty clear. That's referring to all of them. You have Jacob or house of Jacob used 349 times in the scriptures. And that's referring to all the tribes. You have the term Jews. This term is used 270 times in the Jew or Jews, 270 times in the scriptures. And you need, we need to know who it's referring to. Especially when it says the house of Judah or the Jews, and then it says Israel. Very important. Um, then you have the north, um, well, you have the, the term Samaria. This was another term uh, for the northern kingdom. And sometimes that was used to refer to all the northern tribes. And then you have the term whole house of Israel. That is obviously referring to all the other, um, to all the tribes. And then I've got several pages of Hebraisms. When you understand, I'm not, I'll just read them quickly, but when you understand these Hebraisms and how the scripture uses them poetically and prophetically, you will understand that this has to do with the restoration of the two houses of Israel. Terms like adultery, spiritual adultery or fornication has to do, I mean, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, entire book of Hosea talks about this in terms of the house of Israel going, going away from Elohim, committing harlotry. The terms aliens, sojourners, strangers, assimilating to the nations or scattered among the heathen, or the word scattered, beasts of the field, blindness or blindness healed, branches, that is being broken off, cake not turned, captive or captivity, cast away, cattle, Coasts or corners, dispersed, divorce and remarriage. Uh, not all these terms are used, but these concepts. Some of these terms are used, some of these are concepts. If the term Ephraim, meaning doubly fruitful. Um, exiled or outcast, outcast of Israel. You hear the prophets talking, using that term. The term, the phrase far and near, talking about Israel being scared. The fish, the fish of the sea, we talked about them. Fishers of men or fishermen. Fullness of the nations, Medlehagoim. Um, Galilee of the nations. There's a, there's a phrase uh, referring to the Gentiles. The great people, Am Gadol, Jezreel, scattered or sown, lame or halt, lost, lost sheep of the house of Israel, lost among the nations. Um, 
mixed with the nations and the mountains of Israel, referring to nations. It can be for the, the, the mountains of northern of, of Samaria, but can also refer to nations and governments. It all depends on the context. A multitude in the midst of the earth, new covenant or, or old covenant, new covenant, a new, the term new covenant, we talked about it. No compassion or no mercy, lo ruchama, not a people, lo ami, or not my people. Terms that we find uh, mentioned in the book of Hosea and picked up again in the, um, in, in the writings of Paul in the book of Romans, chapter, I think it's uh, 10. Um, olive tree, wild olive branch, uh, two olive uh, branches, one flock, one nation, one, t I mean, it goes on and on, other sheep, repair of the breach, outcasts, other sheep, return, regathering, re re restoration of the kingdom of Israel, sand of the seas, there's a, there's a, there's a Hebraism there, versus the stars of heaven, scattered sheep or lost Israel, um, other sheep, uh, sick, healed, strangers, aliens, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Trees of the field, vineyard, and so forth. These are all phrases in the scriptures uh, that I've identified. There may be others that I have missed, but that I've identified as having pro their prophetic code words pertaining to the two houses of Israel. So we asked. We started this question. Started this by asking the question: um, What is the what is the ha house of Israel? Or wh why is it important to understand the message of the two houses of Israel? The message of the regathering or restoration of the two houses of Israel into into one united family again. And I think I hopefully have given you some food for thought here. And I want to leave you with this thought that. Well, first of all, if we understand who the lost sheep of the house of Israel that Yeshua came to gather, maybe that'll help us to understand who we are and what our job is to do. And I think one of the, one of the most beautiful things, and I especially appreciate this congregation, is that when you understand who you are, when you understand that you are an Israelite, that you are, are part of Israel, that you are part of the covenants of Israel. You're not some wandering goy Gentile out here without God and without hope. Look, the term Gentile just means, in Greek, goy means nations or people of nations. The Greek word, the corresponding Greek word is ethnos, where we get the word ethnicity or eth ethnic or whatever. And it means, it means people groups. So there's nothing wrong with that term goyim, uh, or, or, or goy or eth ethnos. But the way it's used as far as Gentiles in a theological sense can, can have a pejorative connotation. And that's something that applied to us at one time, but not any longer as, as long as we know Yeshua. And we are part of the covenants of Israel. And what's beautiful about this is it doesn't matter what nation you came from, what color your skin is, what your gender is, what religious background you come out of, if you come to Yeshua, there is no more first-class citizen, second-class citizen, there's no more racism, there's no more racial superiority, there's none of this. That eliminates, is obliviated under Yeshua. And we have people in this, in this congregation, they're not all here today, but we have people from, not obviously from America, we have Hispanics, we have people from, from the former Soviet Union, we have people from Asia that are of, of Chinese background, Japanese background, um, a Burmese background, a Filipino background, and some of us come from all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, Heinz 57, and I'm probably missing a few. Uh, uh, we from time to time have some African American people coming here too, which is always wonderful to see. And we opened our arm, we open up our arms to all the races, because if they are in Yeshua, they are part of Israel. That's what the Bible says. It's that simple. And they're my brother, and we're made in the image of Elohim, and we are one. One body called the saints or the ecclesia or the redeemed of Israel or the redeemed or the elect or whatever term you want to use. There's no the Jews and Gentiles or this or that or the whatever categories human beings like to come up with. 
So you want to deal with racism? Get over this racism thing? Come to understand the gospel message in its full sense. And as you know, all the Israelites were commanded to give a, a half shekel uh, once a year, uh, a holy half shekel. And it, that teaches us that one is not worth more than another, and one isn't worth less than another either. We're all equal before Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon His name. He is near. He is near. He is near. Yeshu Hashem Behir Hashem behim atzor 